نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل اقدتا من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعن لی وزیر من احلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم الہمنا رشتا و عزنا من شرور انفسنا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ Today we will discuss and start our lesson from the verse number 40 of Surah An-Nisa Allah says, إن الله لا يظلم مثقال ذرة وإن تقو حسنة يزوى عفها ويؤتي من لدنه أجرا عظيما Indeed, there is absolutely no doubt that Allah does not do injustice even as much as an atom's weight while if there is a good deed, he multiplies it and gives from himself a great reward. The verse is mentioning some attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. The attributes, attributes being that Allah is all just, He is all grateful, and he is all knowing. When a bondsman does a good deed with intention of pleasing Allah, then he who is all seeing, he sees it. He who is all hearing, he hears it. And he who is all knowing, he knows it. He even knows what is concealed in our hearts. He himself says, he is what? Alimun bidhati sudur. And when he sees, he hears and he knows, then he is all grateful. So when somebody does a good deed, it makes him happy. And once he, the grateful, feels pleasure for the good deed being done, then he is very just and so he rewards. He rewards the person himself. What is the concept of being rewarded? And what is the concept of the good deeds, deeds, good deeds being accepted by Allah? Allah says in Surah Zalzal, verse number 7 and 8, وَمَنْ يَحْمُلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرٍ يُرَى وَمَنْ يَحْمُلْ ذَرَّةٍ شَرٍ يُرَى And he who shall have done an atom's weight of goodness shall behold it. And he who shall have done an atom's weight of evil deed shall behold it. So when we ever recite and we go through this verse of Surah Zilzal, there is a very clear-cut message that we should never, never, ever stop from good deeds, however trivial or however small they may seem. Why? Because firstly, we might be considering them small or insignificant, but in Allah's eye, in Allah's eyes, they may be a very, a very huge reward and it may be a very big good deed in Allah's eye like removing the thorny bushes from the road. There are people who think, what difference does it make? But Hadith tells us that it is a sadqa. Similarly, smiling to a person is a sadqa. We just sometimes think, after what difference does it make that we may, we may have a frown or we may be wearing a smile, but smiling to someone is a sadqa. Wiping of the tears, giving a shoulder to cry, giving a helping hand, giving a good advice. So this is all what? There, there are times when we consider that it is a very small deed. 
And this won't make any difference, but it does because in eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not a small gesture. Secondly, there are going to be many small deeds which will all add up. And on the day of the judgment, when the when all our deeds are going to be weighed up, they'll make a huge weight on the day of judgment, inshallah. And the third and the most important thing is that we might be thinking that the deed is very small. But remember, the divine power who is going to appreciate it and who is going to be pleased and who is going to who is going to be happy after we do it is the great, the exalted, the sovereign Allah Akbar. And the next thing we need to remember is that we should refrain from all the evil deeds, however small they may seem. Major sins, minor sins, whatever they are, we need to refrain from them. Firstly, again, because we might be thinking that it is a minor sin, but in, in the eyes of Allah, it may be a major sin. Like, like hurting somebody, making fun of someone, calling them by names, slander, gossiping, backbiting. People normally indulge in all these things by, by just being very casual and being just like very relaxed about it. After all, I was not serious. I didn't really mean it. So we might be thinking that it is something very insignificant, but Allah might have announced it as a major sin. Secondly, many minor sins will also add up and make a huge weight of evil deeds on the day of resurrection. And third, but not the last, and most rightly, the evil deed may be very small and it may, it may be a minor sin, but the mighty power, but the Allah who Akbar, who's, who dislikes it, who forbids it, who is not going to be happy about us is the great and the magnificent. He is the great and the magnificent. He who is the Lord of the day of the judgment. He who is Al-Qahar and Al-Jabbar. He does not approve. He does not allow. So that is why if a sin, even it is a minor sin, it should not be it should not be committed easily. And you know, all deeds are going to be given weight on the day of the resurrection. In Surah Al-Qariya, verse number 6, Allah says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ سَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينَهُ فَهُوَ فِي عَيْشَةِ الرَّازِيَةِ وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينَهُ فَأُمُّهُ حَابِيَةِ And not only this, Allah has also instructed the recording angels, the Karaman Ka, to be in the method and the order of writing and recording the deeds of his bondsmen. In Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says that all our deeds, may they be the sins, may they be the they may be the evil deeds, or maybe they may be the good deeds, all of them are being written down. In Allah says we, we are getting them written down. They're all being jotted down. And all the impressions, all the imprints are also being statistically recorded in a book of records. And you know what? Allah has instructed the recording angels, the Kiraman Katibin, exactly to the finest and to the minutest of details as to how they are supposed to record the deeds of the bondsmen. They have been told that if a person just makes intention of doing a good deed, that he just plans that I will visit a sick relative or I will any any form of good deed, if the person just makes intention, then the then the recording angels are asked to record one good deed for them, one reward for them. And then next, 
if the person after making intention actually performs the good deed then he he is being promised as a minimum of 10 times of reward as allah says in quran also ashara am saliha so when any person does a good deed quran and hadith promises that the writing angels will write a minimum of 10 times of reward and there is no no absolutely no limit of the maximum amount, amount of reward the more sincerity the more sacrifice the better the faith the stronger the belief in which condition one is acting the greater will be the reward then the next thing that if a person makes intention of committing an evil deed then the recording angels have been ordered that they will not write anything and nothing will be recorded subhanallah subhanallah allah is all merciful he is ar rahman he is ar rahim and the recording angels have been instructed that if a person after making intention of an evil deed then actually commits the evil deed then he should be given he should be given the the record of one sin the record of committing one sin subhanallah and you know what this also some hadith report that the angels have been asked that they will record this one sin also after 6 hours in case he might regret or he might repent allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatakhirin rabbi ighfir wa arham wa anta khairur rahimin allahumma innaka afuwan qareem tuhibbul affa fa'fu anna fa'fu anna fa'fu anna اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا واحدنا وعافنا وارزقنا لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين اللهم اغفر لنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم Now the verse forty one, Allah says, "Fakayfa iza jina min kulli ummatin bi shahidin, wa jina bika ala ha ula ishahida." So how will it be when we bring from every nation a witness? and we bring you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam against these people these people means what the muslims the followers of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam against these people as a witness in verse 41 of surah an-nisa allah is briefly narrating the concept of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being a witness for his followers on the day of judgment the day of judgment yaumul qiyama the day of resurrection yaumul hisab yaumul haq yaumut taghabun that it's it's been called by so many names in quran it will be a day of hardships people will be saying haza yawmun usr this is a day of hardships even the prophets even the prophets will be calling out nafsi nafsi o oh, our souls o oh, our souls and people will be talking amongst themselves and they will be trying to find prophets or other people around them who will be interceding for them for their release from the hell fire there is a very lengthy and an elaborate hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in bukhari 
that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, On the day of resurrection, I will be the chief. Do you know why? On the day of judgment, Allah will gather all those who came earlier and later, and the sun will come overhead and very close, which will cause them to be all upset and anxious. And the people will say, let us look for someone who can recommend us to the Lord. And the people will be saying, Haza yawmun usr. And so the people will approach first of all to Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And they will say, O Adam alayhi salam, you are the father of human beings. And you are one whom Allah molded him with his own hands and then blew his soul in you. The angels were ordered to prostrate before you when they did so. Hence, kindly intercede on our behalf. Adam alayhi salam will reply, Today my Lord is an, as angry as he has never been before or will ever be after. Allah had warned me not to go near the forbidden tree, but I defied his orders for which I am worried about myself. So kindly explain. Excuse me, and you go to someone else. And so they will go to Hazrat Nuh and they will they will talk to them, talk to him, and they will say, You were you were the messenger of Allah, and Allah has mentioned about you in the Quran. And please recommend our case before Allah, you are aware of our condition. Hazrat Nuh will also say that he will say that today my Lord is angry as he has never been before, or he will be never after. I had prayed for my nation to be cursed and it was destroyed. That is why today I am worried about my fate. Excuse me. And you look for somebody else for the intercession. Then they will go to Hazrat Ibrahim salam, and they'll say, O oh, Ibrahim, you are the Allah's prophet and you were also his friend. He has been called as Khalilullah. And please recommend us on your behalf. Hazrat Ibrahim salam, will say, Today my Lord is so angry, he has never been before or after. I had lied three times during my life on earth, so which, for which I am worried about myself. So you find somebody else and then they will come to Hazrat Musa salam, and they will say, Oh, Hazrat Musa salam, you are Allah's prophet and he also you also have the distinction of being the one Allah talked to, please intercede on our behalf. And Hazrat Musa salam will say, the way my Lord is angry today, he has never, never, never been so before. And I had killed a man, even when I was ordered not to do so. So I am worried about myself. Excuse me and find somebody else. And then they will go to Hazrat Isa salam, and they will say, you are... You are Allah's prophet and you are the offspring of Maryam and you are the spirit of Allah. You could talk to people while you were still an infant. Today, talk to Allah on our behalf and you are aware of our state. And Isa alayhi salam would say, the, word, the way my Lord is angry today, he has never been like that before. And the Prophet sallam, the narrator says that he made no mention of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam mentioning his sin. But he said that even he would be very restless and he would be very worried about his fate and he would say, Nafsi, Nafsi. And then they will all come to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then what would happen is narrated in another hadith that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that during the life of all prophets, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala awarded and promised them a supplication which will be accepted in their life. And all the prophets supplicated and made prayer and it was accepted but I left my supplication for the day of the judgment that is Prophet ﷺ did not avail of the offer in his worldly life and he left for the day of the judgment for whom for whom not for Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her who was who was his dearest wife not for Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and her whom he said is a part of my body, but for us, for us, for his followers, what will he do? The hadith says 
the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will proceed to the plain of the congregation that is the maidan e hashar and after coming under underneath allah's throne he will prostrate he will prostrate and then he says i will prostrate he said i will prostrate before my lord and i will recite the words of his praise that he will put in my heart and then allah will say o muhammad raise your head and ask for it shall be granted to you and then what will the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say ya allah ummati o allah my followers prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i will intercede with allah and a limit will be drawn for me and i will rescue or help so many people from hell fire and take them to heaven then the whole thing will be repeated the second time and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be again promised that you supplicate and your your prayer will be heard then again prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will say ya allah ummati he will supplicate and people will be taken out from because of his intercession from hell and they will be meant made to enter heaven and this will be repeated for the third time again and then finally prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will say oh allah there's no one left in hell except to those who have been detained by the quran so this will be the intercession of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the day of judgment for his followers but before i proceed i would want all of us to just think and give yourself a few minutes to just ponder over the fact that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the day of the judgment when he will be promised that pray in you you will be given what you will ask for will will supplicate for whom for us do we realize his love for his followers do we realize the love for each one of us and then ask ourselves do we love him that much does our love amount to that level do we love his religion do we love his teachings do we love his hadith do we love reading and teaching his hadith do we love passing on his hadith and his his religion to others do we spend our time our money our wealth our riches to protect his beloved religion Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amala allazi yuballighuni hubbaka And then Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would intercede And then another thing he said that I have been promised a river of Qasr on the plain of congregation that is in the Maidan-e Hashar and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that i will be standing on the river of qasr and i will be providing water from the river to my followers and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that any person who will drink from the water will never get thirsty again and any person who will be deprived of the water from the river of qasr his thirst will never never ever quench So when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to mention about his intercession and about him giving the water from the river of Qasr the sahaba and the companions who were who were actually really desirers of all these things they were really seriously desirers of all these things they used to ask the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they're going to be so many people there going to be so many many people on the day of the judgment how will you happen to recognize us imagine who is saying that hazrat bilal hazrat usama bin zaid hazrat umar hazrat usman who used to spend their days their nights their mornings their evenings with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they they even felt the desire to ask they asked how will you recognize us 
The Prophet وسلم, as reported in a Sahih Hadith in Bukhari, he said, I shall recognize you how Muhajjilina min atharil wudu. I shall recognize you due to the shining and due to the glowing parts of the body which you washed with wudu. And then you and then the Prophet ﷺ suggested, now any one of you who is desirous may increase his glow and increase his noor. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi noora. <coughs> and then about this intercession and about recognizing the people on the river of Qasr, Prophet ﷺ said in a Sahih Hadith, again reported in Bukhari, that on the day of judgment and on the day of resurrection, I will see a few people and I will recognize them as being my followers. But then I will notice that they will, the angels will be stopping them to come close to me. And I will ask the angels, why are they being stopped to come close to me? And the angels will address and they will tell me, that Prophet وسلم, you are not aware that these are the people who after you passed away, they fabricated such and such new things in your religion. So the people who were involved or who are involved in committing bid'ah, in bid'ah will be deprived of the Prophet وسلم's recognition his intercession and the water from the river of Kausar. Prophet Sallallahu said, Kullu biddatin zalala. Kullu biddatin zalala. And then he also said in a Sahih Hadith, anyone who respects or regards or honors a person committing biddat, laisa minna, he is not from among us. So, that is why we actually need to understand and comprehend and then refrain from committing any form of bidha. What do we actually mean by bidha? Bidha is any deed, any deed which the person, before he, he does that deed, he has, he thinks and he plans and he intends that if he does this, any worship or anything, then he will be rewarded with a greater reward. Like, like some supererogatory worships, some supererogatory fasts, salah, and some charity on some specified days or night. There are people who label that if they are done on certain specific days or night, they will be rewarded with a greater reward as compared to other things, other days. So this is bidah. When the Quran or the Hadith or the Sunnah does not give any such concept of extra reward regarding those supererogatory worships. Like for example, talking about the worship of certain nights. As we see, and we clearly learn from the Quran and from the Hadith, worship during the night of Laylatul Qadr and Laylatul Qadr being the alternate and odd nights of the last 10 days of the Ramazan, month of Ramadan, or the worships on the first 10 days of the month of Zilhaj. They have been clearly explained in Quran and in Hadith and also in Sunnah as being a source of a greater reward. Similarly, but on the other hand, no other night other than this, making any supererogatory prayers or salah on any other night other than this, Zilhaj and Ramzan nights, will hold a greater reward. So if done with this intention, it will be a bidda. Similarly, fasts. We know Allah orders the obligatory fasts in the month of Ramazan. And then Prophet ﷺ used to, used to fast his supererogatory fasts 
on every Monday and every Thursday and the wide days of the month being the 13th and the 14th and the 15th of every month and then the sixth fasts of Shawwal and then the 9th and the 10th of Muharram and then the fasts of the month of Shaban and then the fasts of uh, the month, the first 10 days or the first 9 days of Zilhaj. But other than this and beyond this, there are no days specified either in Quran or in Hadith or Sunnah which have been explained to hold a greater reward for the person who fasts on those days. And if a person is fasting on that day with intention and with expectation of a greater reward, then this will be a bidah. Similarly, doing charity on certain days and then certain customs or certain ceremonies of death and funerals, these are all what? These are bidah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hujrat, inshallah, will be covering it soon, says, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله Do not proceed, do not go beyond the orders of Allah and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah help us understand the concept of bida and Allah help us remember them and Allah help us pass it on to others and Allah help us refrain from all forms of bida. Now, this is the concept of the bida and which will be de uh, depriving the people of the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu And then the next verse Verse number 42, Allah says, That day, that day who disbelieved and disobeyed the messenger will wish they could be covered by earth and they will not conceal from Allah a single statement. Now coming over to the verse number 43, this verse holds Many commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, I think we will just manage to cover the first part of the verse today and we will be completing the rest inshallah tomorrow. In the start of the verse Allah says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, O people who believe, la takrabu salata, it is a don't of the Quran. لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون. O believers, do not approach prayers or salah when, while you are intoxicated, until you know what you are saying. So this part of the verse number forty-three. The starting part of the verse number 43 is actually related to the orders forbidding alcohol and intoxicants. And talking about the concept of intoxicants and alcohol in detail, we need to know that Allah says in Surah Al-Araf, verse number 517, uh, verse number uh, in the verse number uh, 115 that Allah says sorry 157 Allah says yuhillu lahumu tawayyibat wa yuharrimu alayhimul qabais Allah will make lawful for them all clean and pure things tawayyibat means what clean and pure and Allah has forbidden prohibited for them all foul things and all forms of wine and all forms of alcoholic drinks and all forms of intoxicants are therefore because they are al khabais they are forbidden. Now before I start with the discussion of the orders of Quran regarding alcoholics, uh, alcoholic drinks and intoxicants, I would uh, want to relate the state of affairs regarding alcohol before the time of the revolution of Quran and before the prophethood of Prophet ﷺ and even during the revolution of Quran and during the period of the prophethood of Prophet ﷺ. People of those time were 
badly habitual and they were badly addicted to all forms of alcohol and they were they were it was actually totally instilled in the whole society and alcohol and these drinks they were manufactured and they they were imbibed by almost every home and in fact in that society people who used to abstain from alcohol and from liquors they were they were looked down upon and they were considered to be mean or they were considered to be miserly people and they were not approved of so in that society and in those state of affairs the orders for the forbidding of alcohol and intoxicants were not just given one fine morning because you know you all realize that anybody who is addicted or anybody who is habitual of alcoholism cannot just leave the drug he is addicted to all of a sudden and we know that the person has to be admitted in a narcotic control center and there the dose of the drug is slowly cut off and it is slowly weaned off and it is tapered and in the interim period he is given alternatives of uh, sedatives and alternative of relaxants and hypnotics and anti anxieties to control the withdrawal effects and then it would usually takes months and there are people who are badly addicted it takes sometimes even a year or more to get him totally off and then there are chances of him or her getting re addicted to the whole stuff so it is not easy getting people off from their addictions so because of that very reason the orders for the forbiddance or prohibiting the alcohol were not just given all of a sudden they were given in stages and we understand about the stages in a hadith which is narrated by hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in musnad ahmad he says that the forbidding of the alcoholic drinks was enforced gradually in three steps and then he explains the three steps the three steps were that he says that when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to medina and uh, the people of medina at their time they were habitual of drinking then they asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam questions very frequently about drinking and about gambling and because of those questions then the verse number 219 of surah al-baqarah was revealed and in it was said yasaluna qan al-khamri wal maisiri qul fihi ma ismun kabir wa manafi lin nas wa ismuhuma akbar min naf'ihima that o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they ask you about the alcohol and they ask you about the gambling and let them know that in both there is a great sin that is allah has called them a major sin and there is also a utility or advantage for men but the sin of them is greater there than their advantages or their usefulness so after this verse of uh, verse number 219 of surah al-baqarah was revealed the transmitter uh, hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that despite this verse being revealed because you see that in this verse there is no forbidding of alcohol or it was not said that alcohol or gambling was made haram but there is just a dislike which was conveyed so has at abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala who says that after the revelation of this verse the companions even continued drinking even they did not leave drinking because you know they were so badly habitual to drinking they even did not leave drinking and then he explains that there was an occasion that the companions had gathered together and there was a dinner and they had food and then they drank and then they offered their uh, congregational salaam and they one of them one of the companions was leading the salaam and was leading the service that he was drunk and then when he recited surah kafirun there he made a mistake 
and once while narrating surah kafirun as the leader of the service of salah then this verse of surah tun nisa verse number 43 this initial part was uh, revealed la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara that do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying so you know even after that what happened was that this order is still not forbidding or making any form of alcoholic drinks or intoxicating in so, uh, intoxicating drinks haram so after the revolution of this verse also the companions even continued to drink they had just altered their routine their timetable they had changed their schedule for example they used to drink after they had offered their isha salah and uh, so that they sleep over the intoxication and uh, the effect would just wear off before the salatul fajr and then and then there was in this period that despite two orders were revealed regarding the wine and alcohol and gambling but still people were not refraining from them hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he used to very frequently he used to raise his hand and he used to pray oh allah reveal an order which eradicates or which abolishes drinking permanently so finally the last order was revealed in surah maida verse number 90 where allah said very clearly ya ayyuhal ladina amanu innamal khamru wal maisiru wal ansabu wal azlamu rijsun min amali shaytan fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun allah said o oh believers the drinks and gambling and idols and divining arrows are only are only what they are the nasty and the filthy deeds of shaitan so do what abstain from them refrain from them stay away from them why so that you may prosper la'allakum tuflihun the trick to prosper were was suggested as abstinence from alcohol and from intoxicants and this was the final order which was revealed in surah maida now after this verse of surah maida was revealed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave a sermon and he said that people all forms of alcohol has been forbidden all forms of alcohol has been forbidden and alcohol is made from five things and then he named the five things alcohol is made from oats from barley from honey from grapes and dates and alcohol from whatever source it is prepared it is forbidden so after this what happened was is narrated by hazrat Anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in Bukhari and Muslim both. Hazrat Anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says that uh, it was a uh, an occasion a gathering in my step father's house as at abu talha and uh, the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had gathered and my father had thrown a, a a party or a dinner and i was serving the food and i was serving the wine and the drinks and in the mean period time i heard that there was a person who was calling out an announcer who was calling out and my father heard and he told me to go outside and see and hear what it was about because it was a norm that whenever a, a verse of the quran was revealed and after the revolution what ever the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said both of these thing that is the verse of the quran and the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were announced in the streets of medina so now hazrat talha radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he asked hazrat anas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu to go out and see for himself that what was being announced he said that i went out and i heard and i came back and i informed them i recited the verse and i told them what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said in his sermon and i told him that alcoholic drinks had been forbidden as beverages so then what did hazrat abu talha say people today have uh, confusion where is it written that 
that all forms of alcohols and intoxicants are are forbidden and allah doesn't say the word haram but you see the people who were the people of the the quranic language and the people whose mother tongue was arabic they understood and what did hazrat abu talha radiyallahu ta'ala anhu order he said that he my father told me that go and throw out all the wine that is in the vessels of the house and then hazrat anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says that at that night the streets of madina were overflowing with wine so this was the response of the people who understood the language of quran the people of the language of quran did not have any doubt they did not have any questions they did not have any interrogations and they did not delay this was samirna wa atwana did by the people of um, the times of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam very clearly very clearly he narrated that all forms of wines were made haram and then there were questions which came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after that a battery of questions which proceeded after that there were people who came like hazrat abu said khudri radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he reports in tarimzi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked by people that uh, we know that uh, wine has been forbidden and alcohol has been forbidden but there are there are a few orphans whose property is wine if you allow we should uh, make uh, we we should convert this wine into vinegar and sell it for them so that the property of orphans will not go waste prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no throw it away pour it out then there were people who came to him and who asked him that uh, there are uh, our jew neighbors and it has been announced as forbidden for us but can we give as gifts or present to the jews prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said we cannot we cannot even give gift a person of a forbidden or a haram thing then hazrat uh, hazrat wail bin hadrami radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in muslim that he came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he was holding wine in his hand and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says stay away from it and he said that i take it as a medicine and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no haram no forbidden thing has shifa in it has cure in it it is not a medicine it is a disease so then we uh, learn by uh, sahih hadith as reported in abu daud that uh, hazrat alam humairi radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he came from the tribe of banu humair and he presented a uh, issue and he asked a question regarded these alcoholic drinks he said that we are a people of mountainous areas and our area and our land is very cool and we are laborers and we work for the whole day and when we come back tired and exhausted feeling cold back to our houses we take a drink which we have prepared and uh, the drink is it does what it it freshes us up and it boosts our energy and it gives us warmth should we keep on taking it prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the first thing he asked is is it intoxicating he said yes then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if it is intoxicating then then refrain from it then abstain from it and do not drink it at all Hazrat Dalam Humairi radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu said that okay oh prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now i've heard the whole thing from you directly one to one in person i will i will obviously obey when i go and i try to i try to persuade and convince my people of the of the abstinence from all these alcoholic drinks they will not submit to it What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if they do not submit to the order of Quran, then then launch war against them. So this is it in an Islamic community, in a Muslim society, in an Islamic state. People failing, not accepting or rejecting the orders of forbidden of the alcohol, they have been ordered to be fought against. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith, Hazrat Anas رضي الله تعالى عنه reports in Tirmizi, he has cursed ten people in connection with wine. One, he who distills wine. 
for someone else. Second, who distills wine for himself. Third, who drinks wine. Fourth, who serves wine. Fifth, who carries wine from one place to the another. Sixth, who receives or accepts wine or something as it, it is sent. Seventh, who sells wine. Eighth, he who buys wine. Ninth, he who gives wine to another as a gift. And tenth, who eats of the money which comes to him from selling of wine. So by these words, actually what is desired is that the whole industry, the whole system, the whole infrastructure should collapse and drinking and intoxication would be abolished in a Muslim society. Similarly, in a Sahih Hadith reported, Prophet said that a person who just stores grapes in a season a person who just stores grapes in a season just for the intention that he will sell it to a person who is going to prepare or who is going to distill wine out of it, Prophet said, then he deals for a piece of hell fire. This is, this is the order of the Prophet Similarly, in a, a hadith reported by Hazrat Abdullah bin Awas who in Musnad Ahmad, Prophet said, whoever drinks habitually, whoever drinks habitually and dies in a state that he will be produced before the Lord on the day of resurrection as a polytheist and as an idolater. That is a person who is who is finding partners with Allah and who is worshipping the idols. What will be the punishment of the person who keeps on drinking? There is a hadith reported by Hazrat Abu Umama Bahli who in Musnad Ahmad that the Prophet says, said that my Lord the Mighty and the Majestic has vowed, he has vowed by his power and glory that whoever of his bondsmen will take even a draught of wine, he will make him swallow it equal amount of pus in the hereafter. Astaghfirullah Rabbi. And whoever of his bondsmen will give up drinking, will give up drinking and abstain from it out of the fear of Allah, he will give him to drink the pure wines of heavenly bonds in the hereafter. And it has been reported in Mustad Ahmad. So, we also need to remember the hadith which you, you've already heard. Let's just revise. Prophet Sallallahu reports in, a, it is reported in a Sahih hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said, three people, three people whose supplication will not be heard, accepted on the night of Laylatul Qadr. And these people, three people will be whom? A person who is habitual, who is habitual to drinking, that is alcoholism. The person who who takes use or takes advantages of riba, and the third is a person who is disobedient to his parents. Then four people, two two words of the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ said there are four people for whom Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has taken his duty that he will not and let them enter paradise, and four people. Who will not even who will not even receive the scent of the paradise? These four people will be again whom number one who is habitual to drinking, the second person who avails of riba, the third person who is disobedient to his parents, and the fourth person is the person who is consuming who is consuming the property or the inheritance of the orphans. So remember. The punishment again in a hadith. Hazrat Jabir anhu in Muslim, he reports that the Prophet said, every intoxicating thing is forbidden. So now that is one thing which I would need to highlight is that Kullu musqirin haram. Kullu musqirin haram. Anything, it's not just about wine. It's just not about alcohol. It is about all things which are intoxicating. May they be wine, may they be sherry, brandy, or different forms of alcohols, or may they be heroin, marijuana, opiums, narcotics, or 
any any form of things which are either swallowed which are either sniffed which are either injected by different means whatever they are all forms of things or drugs which are habit forming which are addicting and which are above all intoxicating they are all forbidden and haram and what is the punishment of a person who is addicted to these intoxicants is prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is the promise of allah concerning everyone who indulges in alcoholic and intoxicants he has made it a binding upon himself to fulfill the promise that he will make him drink the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said what tinatul khabal in his afterlife the companions asked what what does tinatul khabal mean and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it will be the perspiration that is the sweat that will exude through the skin of the dwellers of the hell or the pus which has discharged from the wounds of their body the pus the tears the blood the sweat will trickle from the bodies of the people of the hell fire and they will collect in a valley of the hell and allah will force allah will force those who will be drinking who who were habitual and they did not leave and they did not give up drinking till their death astaghfirullah rabbi min kulli zambin wa tubu ilayk and i also need to clarify that it is not just alcohol it is form of all intoxicants and then may it be a little amount or may it be a greater amount for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported to say as reported by hazrat jabir radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in mustad ahmad in abu daud in tirmizi and ibn majah that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a small quantity of alcohol which produces intoxication when taken in a large quantity too is forbidden so it is not the quality it is not the quantity which is important it can be little amount or it can be a greater amount as long as it is intoxicating it is haram so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun that you will not offer your prayers until you know what you are saying so from here now before i wind up i would also want to highlight that from this i a uh, verse part of for the verse of uh, part of the verse we can comprehend another message of the quran is that allah is saying that whenever you are uttering the words of your salah whenever you are reciting the verses of quran or the verses of your prescribed salah you should be understanding what you are saying number one you don't have to be intoxicated and secondly you actually have to be understanding and you need to be comprehending what you are actually pronouncing what you are actually uttering what you are actually reciting because you know salah is a meeting with allah salah is a time when we are conversing with our lord with our sustainer with our allah so we need to be conscious we need to be aware of what we are saying and what we are uttering to our lord that is why it is advisable to to at least to learn the translation of the verses we are supposed to recite in salah at least at just at least if 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 you're not you just don't have the time and you just cannot learn the translation of the whole of the quran then at least at least i will request and urge all of you to learn the translation of the verses of salah you know what this will help you improve the concentration of your salah as well that is while we're offering salah if we will be concentrating on the meanings then there will be a much much lesser chance of our thought process being distracted here and there during salah rabbi ja'alni maqimas salati wa min zurriyati rabbi ja'alni maqimas salati wa min zurriyati 
ربنا تقبل ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين ثم امين